If you are willing to be a greeter, whether you're in person or online, you can go to the Church Center app and go under small groups, and there's a small group called Service Groups, and there's different places to serve. One of those is greeting, or you can just go and send a text or an email, rather, to office at newlife906.com. So if you're able to, to greet, to be a greeter, either in person or online, um, please let us know. Uh, such a vital ministry. And can I just give a real quick shout out? Um, you know, every week people serve. A lot of times we don't see them, whether they're cleaning, like there's people that are cleaning in between services today. They go through every bathroom. They, they go through this sanctuary. They cut the doors. Um, like they just, like we don't see them. Can we just give them a hand real quick for all that they do? And thank you so much. Um, they're probably already gone, I imagine, because they leave after nine o'clock. But um, again, find a place to serve. If you're willing to, go to that church center app under groups, and there's a lot of places to serve. Uh, stay plugged in. So we are continuing our series that we started. We just kind of touched on it a few weeks ago uh, about who is Jesus. And so we're going to go through the gospel of, of John. Uh, one of the things we touched on a few weeks ago is that the culture that Jesus lived in, uh, many of us think it's just like these Israelite Jews that worshipped in Jerusalem, and that was the culture. But really, there are so many different layers to the culture that Jesus lived in. And so you had this one, the, the Romans, you had the Greeks, you had the Jerusalem Jews, and then you also had another set of Jews that we'll talk about a few weeks later, that the Samaritan Jews that didn't worship um, in Jerusalem, they actually believed that Mount Garrison was the place. By the way, when we go to Israel, we will visit Mount Garrison and Jerusalem. But the place that Jacob had the dream of, remember the stairway to heaven? Not, not Led Zeppelin version, but like the other version, uh, Jacob's Ladder we call it sometimes. And so that was in Mount Garrison. And they also believe that that's also the place that Abraham uh, was going to sacrifice his son. So the Samaritan Jews believed in the Torah, and they worshiped there. So you have really four or five different beliefs uh, kind of coming in besides all the different political beliefs. So when, when the Gospels are written, you ever wondered why there's so many Gospels? Like, why do you need Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Or like, why so many different Gospels? And I think the best way of saying it is that each Gospel really has a particular group in mind. They're, like, they're, they're emphasizing a certain part of Jesus. And so a Jesus is the same. It's one story, but it's told in a little different way. And I think a great way, a great way to illustrate is, how many were here last week for JP? How many? So if I, if I, yeah, so great communicate. If I was to explain to you JP's story, I might consider who you are. And so, for example, if, if you were a veteran, I might say to you, hey, you know, JP served in Afghanistan, and just because I want you, I know there's parts of JP's story that relate to you as vets, right? If you are a musician, and then I'm probably going to talk to you about, man, like, that dude can sing, right? Yeah. Like, like, he plays guitar and sings. If, if I could have surgery and sing like that, I would probably, I would, that part I might, I don't know. Like, dude... So I might highlight his singing with you, but same story. Um, if you were a young person or if you're a youth, I might highlight to you, yeah, I'm 50, young. Anyway, I might highlight to you the fact that JP served because he felt like he wanted to save a life. In other words, I'm willing to give up my life to save your life. And so I, those different parts of the story but it's the same story. Like, do you get it? So when we look at the Gospels, it's really different parts or looking at different audiences that tell the same story. So it's really there's one Gospel and just highlighting different parts of Jesus' life based upon the audience. And that's important to know. So let me give you just like, for example, Matthew. If you read the Gospel of Matthew, you're going to find stuff like, you know, like Jesus fulfilled the, what was written about him, or you're going to see like the genealogy of Jesus. But Matthew highlights this Messiah. So the audience that Matthew is talking to is really a Jerusalem Jew that they want to know, like, 
this guy, is he really the promised one, Messiah? Like, how do we know? There's all these prophecies about who he would be. Like, how do we know if this is really the guy? And so Matthew says, hey, look at this prophecy fulfilled, and this prophecy fulfilled, and look at this prophecy fulfilled, and this one, and this one, and this one. And so we get in Matthew that he indeed is the prophetic fulfillment of the Messiah. If you look at the Gospel of Mark, uh, Mark is one of my favorites because it's very brief, and Mark is kind of to the point. He's just like, bam. And so Mark really has a Roman audience in, in mind. And you find in Mark that often he highlights Jesus as servant. Servant, servant. Which really in, in Roman days is almost like, like kings shouldn't be servants. But he's totally highlighting Jesus as servant king. And so he's hitting this Roman audience. Luke is hitting kind of a Gentile audience to the Greek. So he's highlighting uh, this uh, perfect, glorified man. And so you read Luke. But here's where John, where we want to sit. John does a couple things. John highlights Jesus as God. Like John wants you and me to know who is Jesus. So throughout, when you read the Gospel of John, you need to be asking yourself this question, like, who is Jesus? Who is he? Because this really was the battle that the disciples had their whole life, right? Three years of ministry, and the disciples are like, who is this? Is he a prophet? Is he the fulfillment king? Like, this was like, they didn't even get it. Remember when Jesus goes to the cross and he dies? And, like, they're still like, what just happened? They never get it. So John, when John talks to you and me, he gets us all the way to the very beginning and says, here's what you need to understand. Let me give you the conclusion of the story. Jesus is God, and I'm going to show you how I know that. As a matter of fact, John says this in the end of the book of John. Hey, this whole gospel, these things are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. As a matter of fact, if you read the first part of John chapter 20, it says Jesus did many, many other miraculous things in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. So he did many things. But the goal of John is for you and me to go, you know what? Like, Jesus is God. He's God. He's creator. He's the light. He's our peace. He's our healer. Throughout the book of John, as we study together, you're going to find many different things that Jesus is. And you're going to see Jesus as God in every story, in every situation. Why does this matter? Because it comes down to this word belief. John isn't asking you to have an intellectual understanding of Jesus as God. So John isn't trying to prove to you in a scientific matter so that you have an intellectual grasp of the divinity of Jesus. Like, that's not his goal. The goal is that you might believe and that by believing, you would have life. Two very important words that we're going to dissect in just for, for a moment. The first word, believe. Uh, in the Greek, there's this thing called the present tense or continuous tense. And this is what this means, that Jesus being God, if we really believe it, that we believe it every moment, every day, in every situation. Not that you just say, yeah, I believe it. I believe Jesus is God. Okay, I'm going to live my life the way I want to. It's not, what, it's not what's being said. It's this idea that in believing that it affects everything we say, we do, and how we respond in every environment. That's really belief, right? Like true belief isn't determined in what you say. True belief is determined in what you do. So you can say, I believe, for example, that it's snowing outside, but you put belief into action when you put some gloves on and you prepare for the snow that you believe is happening. 
It's the same way with Jesus Christ. You can say, I believe Jesus is God and he's all powerful and all knowing, but belief is put into action when every decision, every situation, every moment you live your life, you're saying, What would Jesus do in this situation and how can I respond? That's belief. And listen, it's that belief, it's that belief that it comes that gives you life. Why does this matter? I mean, this is so important. I mean, just unravel it, unbreak it apart. I don't know. Like the cool phrase is, let me just unwrap, let me just unpack this. Like that's what everyone says, right? Let me just un- let's just unpack this. If we believe, truly convinced so that life changes, then that belief leads to life in his name. That would mean this, that a belief that's just an intellectual belief will not lead to life. Does that make sense? Right? So experiential belief where you apply Jesus as the Lord of my life, every facet, that kind of belief where you respond to what he's doing and what he's saying will lead to life at its fullest, the other kind of belief, just the intellectual belief, I go to church belief, leads to anything but life to the fullest. John 10.10 10 says it this way. I have come that you might have life. What kind of life? Abundant life. Abundant, abundant life. What's the antithesis of that or the opposite of that? I've come that you might have life. But, right, what does Satan come for? Steal, kill, and destroy. This, like, I just think sometimes if we really could grasp what John is saying to us about who Jesus is, that he's saying, listen, if you follow the plan that Jesus has for you and you really believe in him, then you will have life to the fullest. And that means that when he calls you to act a certain way, to respond a certain way, to trust him in unfamiliar situations, even when your feelings don't follow, he's promising you because he's God, that you will have life to the fullest. But if you say, you know what, I think I might have a different way. I believe in Jesus intellectually, but I have this feeling, this urge for this way, the Bible says in John, John 10, 10, that that life will lead to death, right, destruction, and anything but fulfillment. Like, are, are you with me? So John doesn't start with all the other gospels. He doesn't say, he doesn't say hey, Jesus was born as a little baby in Bethlehem, you know, oh, so cute. He doesn't say that at all. Like, something wrong starting there because they're trying to prove that Jesus is, like, the Messiah, so they have to show the lineage. But, Jesus, but John, like, he goes way back. Here's how John starts with you and me so that we would believe. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And he was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made, and without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. John 1 14. Hey, you know what? That word that was in the beginning, that word that was with God, that word that was God, that word became flesh like you and me and made us dwelling among us. God put on flesh, dwelt among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. So like John says this, that word that was in the beginning, the very beginning of time, through all things that were made were created by him, nothing that was made was without him. That word, that God, that it is God, that was with God, that God walked among us, put flesh on himself, and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory. This is Jesus. This is who he is. Why does that matter? There's so many ways, so many things of why that matters.
G- John introduces Jesus um, in this way. Just as Jesus was in the beginning of creation in Genesis 1.1, he was the word, so when God spoke the word that made things happen is Jesus, he's a person, three in one, right? One God, three in people, one in essence. I know it's confusing, but we'll walk through that, but it's been confusing forever, but we'll get there in a little bit. So Jesus is the word, he's the creator in everything. So John is taking us back to Genesis 1.1, right? Genesis 1.3, God said, let there be light. So the word spoken created light. Jesus is creator of light. Genesis 1, 6 through 7, God said, God spoke, Logos, word, spoke, Jesus spoke, let, let there be an expansion between the waters to separate water from water. So the moment the word was spoken, that creating power is, is, is Jesus. Seven times, Genesis chapter 1 says, God said or God spoke. As a matter of fact, Psalm 33, 6 says, by the word, the heavens were made. And so by the word, by, by the spoken word, by God's spoken word, the heavens were made. All we see is made. This is important because John is saying, just as the spoken word, God's word, came into darkness in creation, that same word is here today bringing light, bringing light into the darkness in our lives. Let me say it again. So just as, maybe I said it the wrong way, just as the Word created light, created in that which was dark in the beginning, there was nothing, there was chaos, there was nothing, the Word spoke life, and out of that came what we see. So like we see light in the beginning. That same Word is the same Word that looks into our lives, and when we have darkness and chaos and the effects of sin, that Word brings life and refreshing to our darkness in our world. Amen. Like, do we get this? Amen. So John brings us back to Genesis 1, 1, so that we'll think about creation, understanding that Jesus on the cross paved the way to, to demolish the darkness and the sin and the strongholds in our life. That's the fulfillment of Jesus. And then he even takes us one step forward. The same Jesus that was there in the beginning in the spoken word, creating something from nothing, creating matter, is the same Jesus that's there in our life in John's day that takes the sin and says, hey, I'm defeating sin, I'm defeating the devil, I'm defeating cancer, I'm defeating the stuff in your life. That same Jesus is also there in eternity when God comes back and brings all things the way they should be. Like, are you with this? This is so huge. Revelation says it this way. This is a long verse, but just hang with me. Revelation chapter uh, 19. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse. So this is at the end of the age, the end of time, whose rider is called faithful and true with justice. He judges and make war. How many love that idea, right? So with justice... He's judging and making war. His eyes are like blazing fire. On his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but himself. He is dressed in a robe, dipped in blood. We know this to be Christ, right? Paid for our sins. Some would say, by the way, the robe, the robe dipped in blood is a result of his justice being displayed across the world. But anyway, we won't talk about that. And his name is what? The Word of God. Where does this come from? John chapter 1, in the beginning the Word was God, was with God, is God. The same Word walked among us in His glory, in His presence. We saw it, He healed, He touched. The same Word comes back in justice and righteousness on a horse, riding a white horse, and on Him is uh, dressed in fine linen, and on Him is called uh, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's good. Even in his mouth, as he declares justice, look what it is. Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword which to strike down the nations. In other words, Jesus, the word, just speaks and justice happens. Jesus. 
Let me just break it down and, and, and then um, break it. I just want to break it down for a moment, walk you through a couple things, and then we're going to call it, call it done for today. Um, what, what do we need to know about Jesus in John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2? There's just four things I think that, that Paul, rather um, John, is, is calling us out. The first one is this. We need to know the time of his existence. When did Jesus exist? When, when was he? Let's go back. Okay. In the beginning was God. So in the beginning. When did Jesus exist? In the beginning. In the beginning. Have you ever asked this question, um, <laughs> if God made everybody, then who made God? How many, like, have you ever asked that? How many still ask this question? Anybody? You never asked this? Nobody? Like the first service, every hand has raised this one, like nobody. If you're online, right, I'll talk to you for a moment. So if you're online today, online campus, um, have you ever had this chance where you're like, like, who made God? Let me exp- like, here's what's hard with it. In our modern world, we have it a little backwards. And so we think of matter, what you taste, touch, feel, like sense, like matter. We think of matter coming first, and out of that matter comes existence, right? But see, in creation story, God was first, and God created matter. Does that make sense? And so the problem is, is our, our minds are a little bit warped because we, scientifically speaking, everything that exists comes from matter, it comes from that something, but the one that created that something was God eternal. So by definition, God can't have a creator because God created matter. This is something for you to chew on at two in the morning. Like, what am I going to do? I don't know. Let me just think about God creating matter. So by definition, God always was. So time's existence, he always was. He created matter. He created everything that we know. What's the essence of his identity? Like, who is he? But this was the question the disciples had. And people like, was he a prophet? Was he just a good teacher? Uh, many people today, Jehovah's Witnesses, was he just a god? Uh, Mormons, was he just one of several little gods? Uh, Muslims, was he just a prophet, a good teacher? Like, who is Jesus? John answers it. Jesus is God. The word what was what? The word was God. The Word was God. He's not a created being. He is God. It's one of the confusing things, right? So, in the beginning, God was the Word, God. And the Word was what? The Word was with God. And the Word was God. Does that sound confusing to anybody else? Right? Right? So in the beginning, God, the Word, God, the Word, in the beginning, the Word was with God, and He was God. Isn't this fun? Sounds like a beautiful poem. Yeah. But that's the whole part of being the God over everything is that like we have a hard time grasping how can you be with God and be in God, but I love the fact that God never says, can you grasp it? He just says this is the truth, that in the Trinity, you have God the Father, God the Son, and we haven't talked about God the Holy Spirit today, but God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, so it's God in essence, God in one, but three different persons, and this is what's so awesome, so relationship uh, to God is that he was with God. So complete harmony. This is a message we're going to talk about in a few weeks. One of the most difficult things that I've had to walk through is this, is that relationship of Jesus 
with the Father is the same. What do I mean by that? Remember what Jesus said? Jesus said, when you see me, what do you see? The Father. So they're perfect in relationship. Have you ever been guilty of, as I have, saying, you know what? I like the New Testament God, but I don't really care for the Old Testament God. Somebody? Like, this was a struggle for me for many years, for years and years and years of like, like the Old Testament God seems so harsh and, and cruel and mean and like, like just have some grace, you know? Like, like, but Jesus comes in, he's like, hey, you know what? I, I don't know. I just felt like sometimes there's two gods. But we're going to talk about in a few weeks that the reality is, is when you see Jesus, you see the Father. When you see New Testament Jesus, you're seeing exactly who the Father is in the Old Testament. When you see the Old Testament, you're seeing exactly Jesus in the New Testament. In other words, sometimes we misunderstand the Old Testament because we don't see it in light of who Jesus was. Sometimes we read into our own preconceived ideas instead of reading into what Jesus said. So what does John want us to know? Hey, you need to know the time of existence for Jesus. He always was. His identity, he is God. His relationship with God. They're one and they're together. They're, they're, they're with God. They're, they're, if you see the Father, you see the Son. And finally, the relationship to the world. Have you ever had a Jehovah's Witness knock on your door before? Yeah, a few of them. Uh, yeah, me too, right? So, so here's the deal. So sometimes um, like they want to get into a debate. And they'll go something about, yeah, so in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And they'll say, hey, you know what? There actually should be an article there. I should say the Word was a God, and so Jesus was just a God. He wasn't like the God. He's just a God. He's a little A, little A, little God, little G. And so like, I don't even go down that path anymore because in like, like a pull it to Greek in any way, this is what's awesome. So I would encourage you, next time a, a Jehovah's Witness comes to your door, do this path here. So, let's just, you know what, forget this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. No, that was a God. Okay, let's move on. Next verse. Through Him, who's Him? The Word, Jesus, through Him, what was made? All things. All things. So Jesus can't be created because Jesus made what? All things. And without him, what was made? Nothing. Jesus is the maker of everything, of all things. So he couldn't have been made because he made all things. And without Jesus, what was made? Nothing. Nothing. So debate your definite article all you want, but the next verse lays it out really, really, whoops, really, really clear right there. Through him all things were made, without him nothing was made. As a matter of fact, Colossians says it this way when I get there. For in him all things were created, things in heaven, right? Angels, etc. Things in heaven and on earth, visible and what? And in invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. How many of you think Jesus made everything? Right? So next time I would encourage you when somebody knocks on your door and says, hey, um, you know what, I'm a Jehovah's Witness or whatever it is. Um, I, I wouldn't debate a whole lot with them to say, you know what, I, I'm, I'm a follower, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ, but um, let's just do this. Let's just pray. And let's just ask Jesus to show himself real in both of our lives. Let's just do that. And see how that goes for you. <laughs> Jesus, just show yourself real right now. And let me know. I'm curious. Let me know how that goes for you. Um, but... Who is Jesus according to John 1.1? 1, 1, I would say Jesus is creator. That's the message I think that's most important to you and to me right now is who is Jesus? He is creator. He is the word, the word spoken, the word that creates, the word that takes 
um, nothing and speaks life to it, the world that comes into the darkness of our lives and speaks light in that darkness and has to dissipate and flee, that's Jesus that we serve. Amen? Amen. Father, I thank you so much for um, your word that's alive. I thank you for giving us the, the gospel of John. and um, I just pray that you would help us, help us move from an intellectual understanding of who Jesus is to applying it in every area of our life. Like it's important that we know, that we understand, that we grasp who Jesus is. But Lord, it's just as important that we, that we live it out, that we put it into action, that we allow Jesus to penetrate every decision, every area of our life, every moment. Let us live in that light. And honestly, um, that only comes through the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. The Holy Spirit both convicts us when we're missing the mark, but then the Holy Spirit also empowers us to live the life that God intended for us. And so that's my prayer today, Lord, that the Holy Spirit, that you would come, that you would convict, that you'd bring to remembrance areas that we need to mature in, areas that we need to trust you in. And then Holy Spirit, when you do that, would you also enable us to live the life that you called us to live? I want to take a moment, if you're here today or you're watching online, um, if you've not given your life over to Jesus Christ, that is the very first step for you and for me. And, um, like he is the eternal word. Like He is our only hope. The Bible declares that there is a bridge between us and the Father, and it's sin that separates. It's sin that destroys. It's that bridge. It's that gap, rather, and that Jesus made the bridge between the two. And if you're here today or you're watching online, you've not given your life to Jesus, I want to invite you to do that today. The Bible says that when we confess our sins to him, that he's faithful and just to forgive us of every sin and cleanse us from unrighteousness. So we're simply saying, Jesus confess that I'm a sinner, that I've missed you. The mark, I, I have failed. I'm not listening to you. I confess that. Lord, would you forgive me? Forgive me of my sins. Lord, would you take control of my life? I give you control. Help me to live for you. I accept what you did on the cross, and I want to give my life to you. Amen. So the power isn't in a prayer, but it's in a heart change. I always say, if you gave your life to Christ, tell somebody that's a believer and say, hey, I give my life to Jesus. What do I do now? If they don't have an answer for you, then let us know. But a great place to start is reading the book of John. Reading the book of John. Hey, if you need prayer today, we have a, a prayer partners that want to pray with you in room number, uh, it's number seven, right off to, right, we go out the door, exit to the right. Uh, they just want to agree with you. So whether you need healing or prayer for your marriage or prayer for your children or whatever it might be, uh, they just want to pray for, with you. Remember, Jesus still creates in the darkest moments. Amen. He still speaks light in the darkest moments. And so we're just agreeing with you that Jesus would speak light into the dark moments of your life, no matter what they look like. Amen?